Psalm 84, 1 through 12. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yet faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and the flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart at the highways is Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And if you would, join me once again in prayer. Let us pray. Father, I ask for this time that you send your spirit to open our ears and soften our hearts. I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to your word, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. I remember the first time um, I went to one of the largest places of praise and worship in Texas. Have y'all ever been in one of those places? You just walk in and the architecture is so magnificent. Your eyes can't help but look up through the skies and you're just like, wow. This is so big and mighty, and I am so insignificant. And as the people poured in, there was a sense of anticipation and expectation of what was going to happen. And then as it began, people arose, and they were excited, and they were clapping, and they were happy to be there. They just couldn't wait. And they started singing great songs, songs that said things like, we'll praise your name, and we'll boost your name to fame. Then the liturgy began. Half of them would say Raider. The other half would say Power. <laughs> Raider. Power. <laughs> of course I'm talking about Jones AT&T Stadium in Little Texas, right? <laughs> you thought I was a church. <laughs> Today of all days, I think that we can acknowledge that sometimes in our society, we like to give <laughs> praise and worship to things other than God. Today, 100 million people will tune in at 4.30 Mountain Time to watch the Chiefs play the other team. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the quarterback from Tech, what can I say? <laughs> and it's estimated that this year alone, 6.8 billion, that's billion with a B, dollars will be bet on this one game. A hundred million people, $6.8 billion. Sometimes we could say that, yes, we do give praise and honor to our sports teams, right? Yes. Maybe a little bit too faithfully for some of us, myself included. But it makes me wonder, what is it that we worship? Do we worship more than our sports? And I often wonder what it would look like if the church and people in the church would have as much passion and desire for God as we do for our sports teams. Yeah. I believe the primary purpose of the church, and this is going back throughout Christian history, all of the readings that I've done in my doctoral program in history have led me to one thing, that the primary purpose of the church is to worship God. That's our main job as a church, is we gather together so that we can worship him, that we can give him thanks and praise, and we can celebrate and rejoice in him. That is what the church is primarily called to do, to worship God. We see this in the beginning of the Gospels, the very first Gospel, Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. What happens? 
The Magi come and they visit Jesus. It says they bow down and worship him. The Magi bring the best of what they have to come and worship the Christ child. We see at the end of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 9, um, the revelation has just been a, unfolded to John, and the angel is standing there, and John starts to bow down and worship the angel, and the angel says, Whoa, John, don't worship me. But he leaves this simple two-word command. Worship God. From the beginning to the gospel, to the end of Revelation, our command is to be a people that worship our God. The primary job of the church is to worship. And a lot of times when we think about worship, what we do is we think about style, right? Well, do they play the piano today or the guitar or their drums? Was there a harmonica? Oh man, a harmonica in church? Who would think about that, right? And why not the organ anymore? Well, what happened to that kind of music? I like this music. What about that kind of music? None of y'all have ever done that, right? <laughs> I have to confess, I was at Asbury working on my doctoral degree, and every class period one week, we would open up with a liturgy um, from the Book of Common Prayer from the Episcopal Church. And we would spend 30 minutes reading and reciting prayers and psalms and scripture, and I was just like, okay guys, let's like have some silence, or can we sing some songs instead of just reciting chants back and forth? And one of my colleagues that's a pastor in New Jersey said, well, so you can't worship God like this? And I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> because it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I liked. It's not what I'm used to. Worship doesn't have to do with style. It has to do with giving God his right worth and praise. As N.T. Wright, one of the Anglican scholars of our society, says worship is really just worth -ship. It's putting worth and value to what has worth and value in our lives. And I often wonder what we give worth and value to in our time. And I believe that the better that we understand who God is, the more that we know about Him and His plan in our lives, now He has worked in our past with the power of His Spirit, the easier it is for us to give Him our worth and our praise, the easier it is for us to acknowledge that he is the king of the universe. The more catechesis, the more knowledge that I have of God, the more I understand his teachings, the better I am to worship him. We see this throughout the story of the Bible, is that it is God who is the one that is truly worthy of our praise. Worship in the Old Testament means simply to prostrate oneself. Head down. And in, this, in an attitude of full surrender. Realizing that the one that I am before. The creator of the heavens and the earth. Is of infinite worth. And without him I would cease to be. When the Old Testament talks about worship, it talks about this posture of our bodies, but also a posture of our hearts. We are to humble ourselves and realize that for us to worship God, we have to put ourselves where God has made us and put God back on top. And I know for some of us, that can be hard for us to do. It means giving him thanks and praise and showing him that he is worth it. And if you think about it, if our goal as followers of Christ is to spend all of eternity with God, right? Isn't that part of our goal as followers of Christ, is to go to heaven? <laughs> then can't we, on this side of heaven, take part of our time to tell him that he is worth it, that he is worthy? And me, this is why the 84th Psalm that we read this morning is of so vital importance. So if you go back to the screen with me on 8 Psalm 84, or if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up there. And listen to what it has to say. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Now you have to remember, when the psalmist was writing these words... In Israel, there was a literal temple where God dwelt, where God's presence was. 
in Jerusalem. Um, we'll be going there later this November if people from the church um, and myself will be standing on the place where they built the temple. And if this was where the Spirit of God descended upon, they had the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And if people couldn't enter that because it was too holy. But you could get to the outer part of it, um, and some priests could go into the outer part of the temple. And the courts, all of the courts were open to anybody that were um, a good, clean Jew. Now, if you were a non-Jew, if you weren't purified, you could enter the courts. And what the psalmist is saying is, listen, my soul longs and faints for you. Even if I can just be in your courts, my heart and my flesh will sing to you. It makes me wonder about how sometimes I feel, we feel about going to worship, going to praise. And then a song that I sang in my teenage years um, reverberated this verse in my brain over and over again. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wicked. It's funny when you were reading that Vincent had were standing at the doors. <laughs> and I was like, I hope you'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. He's saying that a day here, a day in the presence of God, is better than a thousand anywhere else. And it makes me wonder if we have that same desire, if we have that same longing for God to be in our midst, or if we desire other things, and why. Worship, I think, is simply built around um, as Robert Weber, one of the leading experts in, Ameri or, yeah, in American worship, says, it's an ancient future practice. Look at the Old Testament. How did the people of the Old Testament worship? They worshiped because of who God was and what God had did in their past. They worshiped God because he was their creator, right? That's how Genesis 1 and 2 starts with the story of creation. They worship because God took a person that wasn't a people, Abraham, and he made him a people. He made his descendants as numerous as the stars. He gave them a promised land. When they were slaves in Egypt for hundreds and hundreds of years, God literally split waters apart so that they could walk apart in freedom. And they knew who God was. And when they worshiped, they said, God, we worship you because you're our creator. God, we worship you because you sustained us when we were in slavery. God, we worship you because you freed us and you delivered us. You see, worship recalls the past. Worship reminds me when I was four that I remember knowing that God was loved through my local vacation Bible school. When I was eight, that a pastor spoke words of consoling over me after I moved. At the age of 11, God did a miraculous, part of a miraculous event in my life of a family, and my family went from a place of death into a place of life. At the age of 15, when I fully surrendered my life to Christ, and I felt the spirit like I never had before, and at the age of 17, when he said, be a preacher, and I was like, you've got to be kidding, right? Because every 17-year-old wants to be a preacher. <laughs> at the age of 19, when I was still in denial, and the rains, literally, there's one little bitty rain cloud over Walmart and South Loop in Lubbock, Texas, and it rained there because I still didn't think God wanted me to be a preacher, and he spoke to me through that. At the age of 22, when he brought Ashley into my life, at the age of 27, when I thought my baby girl was going to die and he delivered her, my God was there. And because of that, I know that he deserves my worship and my honor. And God has been here, too. God was here in 1946 when Hazel, when Hazel Kennedy moved into this community and said, hey, there needs to be a Methodist church in this community. He was here in 47 and 48 when the first log cabin was built. He was here 18 months ago when we had to fire architects. He's here as we're pouring slabs, and he will continue to be here into the future. Amen? Amen. And because our God has acted in the past, he is worthy of our worship and our honor and our glory. Worship is an ancient event. But worship also points us to the future. If you look at the whole of Revelation, now I understand if a hundred different people read Revelation, you'll probably get a hundred different translations and variations of what it means. But the whole of the book paints this picture of creation coming back to God and worshiping Him once again, where there will be no more weeping or pain or sorrow or tears or death, but all will have life with those that are in Christ, and the relationship and creation will be restored as it was in the beginning, so it is and ever shall be world without end. Worship points us to a future where we remember that we are part of a great cloud of witnesses of those that have gone before us. 
It was like my grandmother who read her devotional every day and it taught my mom how to pray our meal prayer that my family still prays because of my grandma's faithfulness, my grand, her great grandkids know a prayer. People like the three teenagers that I had to bury when I was in Seagraves, Texas that died in tragic accidents and God bless John Dylan Rasher who had the joy of Christ in his heart. And I remember, look forward to the day where I will be able to worship God with him side by side. I look forward to the day when I can worship with the cloud of witnesses of the saints that have been faithful, that have died after a long and faithful life in Christ, and know that we will all be feasting at his heavenly banquet. It reminds us of the cloud of witnesses of people like John and Susanna Wesley and John Calvin and Martin Luther, the saints that have helped transform and continually reform the church into who we are today, and the fathers of our faith like Irene, Irenaeus and Athanasius and Augustine. People that set our doctrine and who we are as followers of Christ. People like Martha and Mary and Rahab and Abraham. It reminds us that one day we will be in the great cloud of witnesses as well, worshiping God with them. Worship reminds us of the past but anticipates the future that isn't quite here yet. And worship, it brings us to the table. It brings us to the table of our Lord and our God that we're able to remember his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. It puts us together with all of those that have come before us that have partaken that I just mentioned in the great cloud of witnesses. It reminds us that we're not alone as followers of Christ, that today alone almost a billion people came to this same table to remember the sacrifice that Christ had for us that we are not alone, that you are not alone, that we are a part of God's church universal. And we come to this table to remember who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. And we join together with all of the saints in taking in Christ's body and Christ's bread. You see, the primary job of the church, of any church, of all the church throughout history, is for us to be a men and women who give God his proper worth and his proper value. And to say that God, you are God and I am not. So I'm willing to prostrate myself before you. To thank you for what you have done. And to look forward to what you promised to do. And so as long as I continue to lead you, I will be a person that I try my best that will lead us into worship of God. And that will be our primary job as a church. Get it? Good. Some of y'all know it. We need to be a people that enter into his courts with thanksgiving and enter into his gates with praise. They realize that one day with God is better than a thousand days anywhere else. Let us be a men and women who worship our God and our King. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for who you have been in our past, who you are right now, and who you promise to be. I pray that as we continue to worship you through the worship of the table and through song, that you would just allow us to fully surrender ourselves to you. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.